in Library Corps. How does the back DNA get from Mapping Corps to Library Corps? Well, a technician from Mapping Corps streaks the bacteria containing the selected backs onto small auger plates. These plates are placed in a 37 degree incubator and grown overnight. The next morning, a technician from Library Corps removes the plates and picks single colonies to inoculate 250 milliliter liquid cultures. Why do you need such large liquid cultures? In order to have enough DNA to sequence, we must grow up millions of copies of the backs. Oh, so since each bacterial cell contains one copy of the back, millions of copies of the bacteria would t contain millions of copies of the back. You got it. Now the DNA must be extracted and purified from the bacterial culture. This is where the cells are lysed, proteins removed, and clean DNA is precipitated. To be sure that this is the correct back, a little of the clean DNA is cut with restriction enzymes and run on a gel. Just like in mapping? Yes, the same procedure. This is actually a checkpoint for the DNA. We want to make sure the DNA grown up in the culture is the same as the original back DNA we chose as part of the golden path in mapping core. So, we compare the banding patterns of this gel with the earlier one from mapping. Next, the rest of the clean DNA is sonicated. Sonicated? Sonicated. Sonication is the process of breaking up the DNA into smaller fragments by exposure to intense sound waves. These smaller fragments are run on a gel with sizing markers. Specific size fragments are cut out from the gel and the DNA isolated from the gel matrix. The DNA fragments are then treated with a specialized enzyme called a nuclease, which makes them blunt-ended. What do you mean by blunt-ended? Remember, DNA is double-stranded, and sonication may cause the DNA to break so that one of the strands is a little longer than the other. We call this an overhang. We need to fix any overhangs and a nuclease will do this. So now you have the genome in pieces. What do you do with those pieces? As you may have guessed by now, we can't take an intact genome and stick it into a sequencing machine. An intact genome is just too big and a back is still too large for a sequencing machine to handle. So each back must be broken down again into smaller pieces of about 2,000 base pairs. And that's what you use the sonicator for. Correct. And now that the DNA is in smaller pieces, we need to make many copies of these fragments. To do this, the fragments are ligated or attached to a vector and then put into a competent cell using electroporation. The cells are then spread onto these large auger plates and are incubated at 37 degrees overnight. Can you explain electroporation? Well, you know what bacterial transformation is, right? That's just inserting foreign DNA into a bacterial cell. Exactly. Electroporation is one technique for doing bacterial transformation. We shock the bacterial cells at high voltage and the electric current creates holes in the cell membranes. These holes are large enough for foreign DNA to pass through and we end up with bacterial cells carrying the DNA that we want to sequence. Okay, we're off to picking core now. I think you'll really like it there. The picking core technician retrieves large auger plates from the incubator and then she places them on the Cupix machine. The machine will then scan each of the plates and look for nice uniform isolated colonies. The 96 needle robotic arm will then pick these colonies, place them into glycerol and growth media that are contained in the 384 well plates. The computer software is so sensitive that it will not allow colonies that are too close together to be picked. So each clone that's picked represents a single transformation event. This is a lot better than picking colonies by hand with toothpicks. So this robot is inoculating many liquid cultures? Exactly. After incubation overnight, the 384 well plates are brought to a spectrophotometer, which is a machine that sends a light through the bottom of the culture and checks for cell growth. What happens if it doesn't grow? Well, we don't worry if a few wells per plate don't grow. If a significant number did not grow, we'll discard that plate. 
and then we'll go back to the auger plate and pick new colonies. This is an important quality control and cost saving step. In inoculation core, they're responsible for taking a small aliquot of these cultures and transferring them into a larger culture, which is a 96 well plate. So if you're only going to use an aliquot, what happens to the rest of the old culture? The plates are archived in freezers. We always want to be able to go back in case there's an error further along in the production pipeline. This way, we don't have to start the entire process all over again. Okay, let's go to prepping. Now, back to those 96 world plates. The new living cultures here in prepping core are picked up by the technicians and incubated overnight. The next morning, the technicians will remove the plates from the incubator and they will spin the cells down and pellet them in a centrifuge and they'll just discard the supernatant. So can you tell me the first step in isolating DNA from cells? First you have to lyse the cells to break open their membranes. Exactly. And the technicians here in prepping core will add a resuspension buffer to those cells. The pellets are then resuspended and vortexed and the plates are then placed on the plate tray. The robot begins by adding a magnetic bead solution that also contains a lysis solution. Each plate goes through a series of steps Although the Genome Sequencing Center uses a robot for this process, in many research labs, they simply do it by hand. So do you know what comes next? So now you have to remove all the non-DNA stuff, right? Exactly. All the proteins and cellular debris must be rem removed, and this is done by the magnetic beads. They are positively charged and they're porous. Since DNA is negatively charged, it binds to the beads. Exactly. In fact, the plate is gently vortexed to ensure that as much DNA as possible binds to the beads. Next, the plate is moved over a powerful magnet, pulling the DNA bound bead into the bottom of the plate. And then the supernatant is removed by a vacuum. After several washes to remove residual proteins, the DNA is clean and ready to use in sequencing reactions. So, now we're ready to go to sequencing. Hey, Andrea. Another tour? Yes. This is Livy and Bryson. They're two Washington hey. University students, and they're interested hey, in our work here at the Genome Center. This is Dr. Rick Wilson. He's our center's director. Nice to meet you. What brings you guys here today? I'm researching a pathogenic bacteria in one of my classes, and so I thought I'd come see how sequencing works. And I'm researching career options for after graduation. Terrific. Well, I think you guys have both come to the right place. Uh, as I'm sure Andrea has told you, since we finished sequencing the human genome, we've moved on to the genomes of other organisms, including pathogenic bacteria, so we can better understand the interactions between hosts and uh, pathogens. So will there still be jobs even though the human genome is done? Absolutely. We've gone on not only to sequence the genomes of pathogens, but other animals so we can better understand the human sequence. And we've also started sequencing individual genes from patient DNAs so we can better understand the sequence changes in the genome that cause disease. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. thanks for stopping to talk My to us. My pleasure. You yeah. guys have a good tour. Yeah, thank Take you. care. Thank you. you too. On to sequencing. Okay, back to the production pipeline. The sequencing process begins by eluding the DNA from the beads with water. Once the DNA is in solution, the magnetic beads are pulled down to the bottom because they're placed on another magnet. Now the DNA is clean and ready to be sequenced, and this process begins by placing them on the biomet machines. Another robot? Yes. This robot transfers the clean DNA from the wells into a 384 well plate containing a PCR reaction mix, including a small amount of each DNA base with different fluorescent dyes attached. So what's the purpose of the PCR reaction? The PCR reaction is where the DNA's amplified and fluorescently labeled bases are added to the ends of each fragment. Each reaction requires multiple copies of a double-stranded DNA template, which is a fragment from the genome being sequenced. Many copies of a specific single-stranded oligonucleotide primer, which acts as a starting point for DNA synthesis. TAC DNA polymerase, an enzyme that can add nucleotides 
to a DNA strand during DNA synthesis. Free floating single nucleotides and some fluorescently labeled terminator nucleotides that are designed to stop DNA synthesis. Changes in temperature are the key to making the dye terminator reaction work. First, the reaction mixture is heated up to 96 degrees Celsius so the double-stranded DNA template denatures and becomes single-stranded. Second, the reaction mixture is cooled down to 50 degrees Celsius so that the oligonucleotide primer can base pair with or anneal to the DNA template. Third, the reaction is warmed up to 60 degrees Celsius so TAC DNA polymerase can perform DNA synthesis. TAC is able to put free-floating nucleotides into the correct places along the DNA template so that a new complementary strand of DNA is extended from the primer. However, when a terminator nucleotide is put in place, TAC is no longer able to add more nucleotides and DNA synthesis is stopped. Multiple rounds of temperature cycling are necessary for the reaction mixture to generate an array of DNA fragments of differing lengths. The PCR machine is able to make rapid transitions between the different temperatures. Each time the reaction mixture is heated for denaturing, cooled for annealing, and warmed for extension, more DNA fragments are created. The fluorescently labeled terminator nucleotides each have their own specific color. A is green, T is red, G is yellow, and C is blue. After the multiple rounds of temperature cycling, any DNA fragments that can fluoresce green must have an A as the terminating nucleotide. Those that can fluoresce red must have a T at the end. Those that can fluoresce yellow must have a G at the end and those that can fluoresce blue must have a C as the terminating nucleotide. The random assortment of free-floating nucleotides and fluorescently labeled terminator nucleotides ensures that the newly synthesized DNA fragments are each terminated at a different place along the DNA template sequence. The goal is for the reaction to result in an array of fluorescent DNA fragments that have only a single nucleotide difference in length. The sequencing reaction is considered finished when multiple copies of every possible DNA fragment have been generated. All of the fluorescently labeled DNA fragments created in the dye terminator reaction now need to be separated by size. This is possible with gel electrophoresis. When the fragments are put in order from smallest to largest and the terminating fluorescent base color is analyzed, then the corresponding terminating nucleotide can be identified. So the fluorescently labeled bases are the key to reading the sequence? Yes, they're critical. So now we can just read the sequence, right? Not just yet, they must be loaded onto sequencing machines. This machine has a tiny capillary tube filled with a polymer that allows the DNA fragment to separate by size when an electric current is run through the polymer. So that's just like regular gel electrophoresis. Yes, but unlike conventional gel electrophoresis, this machine takes it a step further. It not only runs out the DNA fragments, it reads and records the sequence. How is that possible? As a DNA fragment migrates through the polymer, it is hit with a laser beam that excites the fluorescent dye attached to the terminal base of the fragment. A camera captures an image of the fluorescence and a computer converts it to a readable form that we call an electropherogram. The electropherograms or sequence trace files are stored on servers and downloaded by employees called finishers. What do finishers do? In finishing core, they assemble many fragments of back sequence into one contiguous, high-quality sequence of DNA. First, the sequences are run through a set of computer programs called FRED and FRAP to assess sequence quality and line up similar sequences. The finisher then uses a program called CONSED to look at the assembled data and identify problems. She examines each sequence region and can request that additional data be generated where needed. So DNA can be sequenced more than once? Yes. We refer to this as coverage. For example, 
if we sequence a genome four times, we say that our data for that region has 4x coverage. The higher the coverage, the more accurate the final sequence data. As you both know, DNA is a complex molecule. This complexity can result in problems for the finishers. Once a finisher conquers all of these problems, the end product is a contiguous sequence of DNA of high quality that can be passed on to public databases. We upload all of our DNA sequence data from the databases every day so that the information is freely available to researchers around the world. So if finishers put the sequence fragments together to form a bag, who puts all the bags together? Members of Analysis Corps. They are responsible for confirming the placement of the individual backs in the original map. They also annotate the finished sequence or label specific regions of the sequence with appropriate names or other identifying information. So when is the sequencing of a genome considered finished? Well, depending on the organism being sequenced, there are specific criteria for how the data is presented to other researchers. The International Human Genome Consortium ensures that data from the Human Genome Project meets consistent standards. We made sure our data for the project had 10x coverage and an error rate of less than 0.01%. That's less than one error per 10,000 bases. Interesting. There are consortiums formed for each of the other organisms being worked on and they determine their own criteria for coverage. Okay, let's head on to technology and development. 